The basic idea when playing the trumpet or while making music in general is that the musical idea sets processes in the body in motion to produce sound. I am very pleased to meet with Matthias Hoefs and we will discuss this topic amongst others. Matthias Hoefs is a professor at the Music High School in Hamburg, a member of the German Brass Ensemble and an internationally renowned soloist. Matthias, what is the significance of the inner hearing of sound for you when playing the trumpet? For me, sound is something like a business card you share, not only as a trumpet player, but as a musician. Each instrumentalist who comes on stage and tunes in shows this business card. It's something like an ID card. Everyone has a personal sound, and if you don't have an idea of that sound, you cannot make music. You need very precise objectives for certain music, for certain periods, for certain instruments. That, for me, is the center of my art. Particularly in the case of our instrument, it's quite common to view playing the trumpet as kind of sport. I know many trumpet players who can perform technical exercises for hours without having the sound in mind. I wouldn't recommend this at all. Instead, no matter what I play or when I play, starting with the first note of the day, I focus on the question, what would I like to sound like? That also adjusts my technique. You know, notes are just black dots on a sheet of paper. It's our job to bring them to life. We succeed with a precise idea, and this idea can vary. If I go on a stage or enter a concert hall, then I'm inspired by the atmosphere, the acoustics, and through my own disposition, by the way I feel, good or bad, which sometimes forces me to play a bit slower or faster because that's how I feel in the moment. So music must remain flexible and alive. It also helps to play the same music repeatedly and discover it each time in a new and fresh way. For me, music sounds its best as if it were created, composed or improvised in that very moment. If we can convey this, then we'll reach the audience. With that, good music, whatever style, is exciting and pleasing to every audience. Some say that you have to master the technique first, before you can begin to make music. What do you think about that? I think that it fits together. Of course, we need certain prerequisites to be able to make music, but it's impossible to separate sound from technique. You can't look at them separately, because with our instrument, technique is more than 90% inside the body. You have to feel it. I can't look at technique from outside with a mirror, because technique happens inside the body, in the throat. Also, tongue position is particularly important for us. Relaxation in the diaphragm area is extremely crucial for both sound and for technique. None of this can be separated. It all works together, like it is with singers. In principle, I think that if you want to work musically, you need a solid technique and the ability to play the piece. I think we can all agree on that. Often, though, in classical music, we justify metric inability or the inability to play something at the required tempo with an excuse because we want to make music, and music means freedom. But freedom only begins if we have the ability to play it perfectly in time, if we later decide that we'd like to delay or play faster for this or that reason, then that's something different from rushing or dragging due to technical inability and then trying to justify it musically. It just won't work this way.
The context of music is also part of the inner hearing. There's the epoch, baroque or classical, whether you play in the orchestra, are a soloist or make chamber music, like in the German brass. How do you prepare for these things? Does it happen in the moment? Do you just tune into the situation, the orchestra, the circumstances? Or is there a way to prepare? A knowledge of music is, of course, a prerequisite. And the more we know about the composer, about the piece and the hall, the better. How does the hall sound? How sustainable is it for my instrument? Where do I place myself? These things are essential for the great results you want. Last but not least is your contribution as an instrumentalist, as an artist, which also depends on your personality. Sometimes with certain music you have to fight against your personality and your feelings. And so I believe that the kind of music you play is crucial. Every epoch has, of course, certain stylistic requirements and demands something special in the music. You have to see it in the temporal context, when the music was performed. We can't know how the music actually sounded because none of us was there. I think everyone has the right to feel and understand music differently, depending on the context and culture from which that person comes. I think this makes it particularly interesting. If we require a universal style of musicians, we hope to ensure that all orchestras or soloists sound more or less the same. Oh, say because it's improper to play with vibrato or without vibrato or because it must be played in a very specific tempo. If we follow this path, then the wonderful range of artists and various orchestras will be no more. This is especially true for us brass players, because we have so many different instruments, and of course each instrument has its own individual character. But I find it very interesting to listen to French or German music not being performed the same way at different places. Also, the different instruments make it ultimately appealing. Nowadays it's common to perform historically informed. Is there a contradiction to what you are saying, that you want to revive the music and reignite the fire? I understand your approach is to play on modern instruments and use the new opportunities to uncover fresh aspects of the music. Yeah. I find it extremely stimulating, and without the development of historical performance practice or the old instruments, one would play this music quite differently today. But if you try to play on modern instruments with similar exuberance as do the instrumentalists with historical instruments, if we can transfer this, then we can discover this music as wonderfully vital and invigorating with modern instruments. Interestingly enough, in the Baroque period, there were perfect string instruments that had a well-balanced sound, and there were wind instruments that had certain problems, an unbalanced sound, poor intonation, or a limited number of notes that could be played on brass instruments. It took literally centuries of development to reach the perfection of keyed or string instruments. And today, one tries to include this imperfection in music. But I think it's possible to demonstrate an enormous sound palette on modern instruments. On modern instruments, you can bend sounds as they did on the natural trumpet, or you can play with an equally large sound as on a natural trumpet with a corresponding pipe length. All of this is possible, and then particularly appealing because you can play music without compromise. <laughs> I love to explore all aspects of my instrument, along with the development of new instruments and the revival or rediscovery of old instruments. I love to arrange, and that, of course, gives me an opportunity for my instrument, or for German brass, for my colleagues, to bring music to paper, which at first perhaps doesn't seem to fit our instruments. This is also the recipe for the success of German brass, 
we have this versatility of colors of music and thus can reach a wider audience. If you consider what options we have compared to other instrument groups, then I must say that this is really something out of the ordinary. If we only look at the dynamic bandwidth that a brass ensemble or a single brass instrument has, especially when using mutes, then we have cylindrical, conical instruments, and one won't assume that all of them can be operated by one instrumentalist. This also makes it very attractive for me to play the trumpet. It is fascinating to watch German brass because you can't even see who's giving all the cues. All start at the same time, play the same pace, it's perfectly in tune and more. How is this possible? Is it because you have played together for such a long time? Experience is of course useful and important to make music together, but it's also much easier if there's no conductor. Conductors must be quite brave now, but a conductor tries to transport and communicate something. If you, on the other hand, can feel it directly and breathe together, then you don't react, since any reaction makes it harder to make music, or makes it virtually impossible. Only if you feel together, music emerges, and that is of course much easier without an intermediary. What also stands out is the awesome communication in German brass. One can see a wink of an eye in one direction and all of a sudden something happens within the ensemble and from the outside you can't tell what it is. In any case, it's a pleasure to watch. Is it something you practice in the ensemble deliberately or has it just developed? This ability to create something together. Well, both, of course. The musicians have been making music together for such a long time and, and thus function seamlessly together. But of course, there are certain things that we must coordinate. For example, we now have Rhapsody in Blue in the program, which I arranged. There are lots of tempo changes in Rubati. I tried to transfer the piano part, the solo part, into the ensemble. We have to coordinate this because we have to know exactly who gives cues, who's leading when, and so on. If you read the score, then you first have a great deal of respect and you believe that playing it with 10 people together cannot be done. But if you work on it, then it suddenly functions. Then you can close your eyes and it just flows. And this is a great joy. This experience, I think, is worthwhile. From time to time, I work as a coach with orchestras and we play with large numbers of musicians without a conductor. At first they ask me, could you conduct at least in the concert? And I reply, no, I'm not a conductor. And you won't believe what joy it is to succeed without a conductor. You have been studying Georg Philipp Telemann a lot recently. He was one of the most productive composers of all. He composed more than 3,600 works. Could you tell more about Telemann and trumpet? Telemann, oh, was truly a genius. He was an exceptional composer who's completely underestimated and underrepresented. Of course, as a citizen of Hamburg, perhaps you have a different relationship with this composer, who was one of the most famous in his time. You're able to say, as a citizen of Hamburg, this composer shaped the music culture of Hamburg for more than 50 years. And it wasn't just in one position. He was the head of the opera, music teacher at the Johannium, and musical director of the five main churches. Each of these positions, of course, expected compositions from him. He wrote over 1,000 cantatas, had to deliver two passions each year, and more. Edward Tarth said that hardly any composer has composed so much for the trumpet, including all contemporary composers, and is truly remarkable. My first and very personal experience with Telemann was when I was 10 years old and had a lesson with my trumpet teacher, Professor Kalinzi of the Academy of Music in Lübeck. He asked me if I wanted to play third trumpet in a Bach cantata. This was my first concert ever with a chamber orchestra and the first trumpet player who performed in a Telemann concert. 
I thought, it cannot be possible to play like that on such a small trumpet. Incredibly high and brilliant and bright sound, and it captivated me. It's still a vivid memory, that experience, the first time I heard a Telemann trumpet concert. I had a wonderful opportunity with the Chamber Philharmonic Bremen to record the three trumpet concerts and the sonata in B minor. With modern instruments, because the piccolo trumpet is available now, I can implement what I have in mind without having to make compromises concerning sound, etc. Also, the combination with two other works that are not original compositions for trumpet, from the school sonatas, the sonata in B minor, which wasn't composed for a specific instrument. At the time, it was common to compose sonatas for flutes, oboe, or a violin, just with continuo accompaniment. We transferred this to the modern piccolo trumpet, and by doing so, we showed the development that has taken place with that instrument. Also concerning expression, Telemann trumpet concerts are composed in D major, representing pomp and splendor and the connection to the divine. The contrast is a completely different atmosphere, a very gloomy, melancholy mood, B minor or G minor, which is also possible on our modern instrument. Georg Friedrich Hindal always used trumpets in a bright and glorious way. On the other hand, Telemann in two trumpet concerts started with a slow part, having an introverted impact if played accordingly, which wasn't typical for trumpet that's usually loud in the foreground, etc. In this way, Telemann showed the trumpet from a totally different perspective. This is what I found particularly fascinating with these two trumpet concerts. It's really something extraordinary, and no renowned composer of this time, neither Bach, Vivaldi, nor Hindal, has written solo concerts for the trumpet. For this reason alone, Telemann is special. For me, it's very appealing, and it's a hobby that I've pursued since childhood, developing instruments. My friend and instrument maker Max Tyne and I have developed a couple of instruments together, which is really special. I brought a few of them to show what drives me. Some are instruments that have been around for hundreds of years. There was a time when many small manufacturers all produced individual instruments. Nowadays, a few big companies reproduce or improve the same model again and again. So the richness or the diversity is lost, and I think it's a pity, particularly because our instruments have a large variety of sounds which can be used on different occasions. I shall begin with this keyed trumpet here. This is the instrument Haydn's beautiful trumpet concerto was originally written for. It was developed from the natural trumpet. Anton Weidinger experimented with keys to increase the notes one can play in the middle octave and so we got the famous Trumpet Concerto by Haydn. This was his last solo concert, so we incorporated all the experience of his compositions into this concert. What's more surprising is actually how rarely, or not at all, this trumpet concert is performed on a keyed trumpet. It may be due to the fact that, as you can see, it's not easy or it's uncommon. It requires a special way to use the keys, and a modern trumpet player who is used to three or four valves and, and now suddenly faces five to seven keys has to learn like a beginner. This takes time, especially if you consider that it's the only concert for the keyed trumpet in E flat. Shortly afterward, Hummel composed his E major trumpet concerto, also for the keyed trumpet. After that, the valve was invented, and the keyed trumpet was immediately forgotten. For me personally, this trumpet is particularly delightful. When I recorded this with the Concerto Köln, it was a special experience for me. Next is a special instrument. I call it a double bell trumpet. It was developed from the so-called echo cornet of the 19th century. It's an instrument with two bells and a valve to switch between them. The second sound cup is movable, so it can be tuned and you can change the direction so you can play your own echo. You can use the bells with different mutes and thus there are many possibilities. 
Because the second bell is tunable, it's also perfect as a quarter-tone trumpet or eight-tone trumpet or however you choose to define that interval. So it's a playground for many composers. This is a flugel horn, and here we've tried to expand the range downwards by equipping it with a fourth valve. You can play down to the C, so you have an enormously large range. I have applied many things to this instrument that we know from the rotary trumpet. There's a pitch finder attached. That means it's possible to change the intonation for each individual sound up or downwards without having to give up the center of the sound. For example, there are also holes, which we're familiar with from the natural trumpet, that you can use as intonation holes. Next is a rotary trumpet in B-flat. I use it in the orchestra or as a solo instrument. We have a removable bell attached, as it's known from the French horn. This gives us a lot of great possibilities. I can demonstrate it briefly. Using various sizes and different material combinations, we have many possibilities to affect the sound. This is interesting, especially since we're now able to isolate the ways in which different materials, alloys, or forms affect sound and the instrument. This is a wonderful instrument. We call it a descant horn. The sound, being indirect, going backward, is particularly voluminous, and in a hall with big acoustics, the sound is multiplied. It has the same tube length as the flugelhorn in B-flat because it's also a B-flat instrument. It's just perfect for the post-horn solo from Mahler's Third Symphony, Mozart's post-horn serenade, or for Bach cantatas with horn parts if you want to perform with modern instruments. This was a small insight into my hobby room with the instrument maker, Max Time.